up, everybody? Let's get our volumes good here. Make sure everybody's doing good. I'm going to try not to overclip the mic today. I'm going to put it far away from me so I don't overclip it again. How's everybody doing, man? Welcome, welcome, welcome back, everybody. Uh, what is up, Chris? What's up, Robert? What's up, Tampa Station? What is up, the Emerja? Welcome, welcome. Thanks for coming back on this beautiful Tuesday morning. What a good day it is, huh? It's, uh, the weather got pretty cool this weekend. We had some snow. We had uh, a lot of rain. We had uh, all kinds of fun stuff. Got to run a fire in the fireplace this weekend a bit. That was nice. Um, everything is going good. I got my my uh, Christmas cup of coffee here to the best sister-in-law ever. And uh, yeah, it's all good. What a beautiful Tuesday. If you guys enjoyed the weather this weekend, be sure to hit the like button. Always good to hit that like button to get things started. And of course, let me know if uh, anything looks or sounds out of line. I think I'm going to try to get a little bit better with the uh, with the EQ on this mic. I'm going to try and dial up the bass a little bit more, see if I can get a little more of a, a radio personality here. And I think I'm going to just taper off some of the high end on this thing. I think uh, I get a little too... I don't even really know how to describe it. It's like... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I, I'm trying to think of a good good audio term, but it's kind of like crinkling paper. <laughs> it's like uh, that range of my voice. I want to see if I can dial some of that out using the EQ. So we'll see if we sound any better today. Hopefully everybody is enjoying the, the sound of my voice here. So let's talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, today. Today we are going to take a look at some more of the bass guitar. You know, last week we got to work on this tuner and I thought we made some excellent progress on this tuner, but we'll talk a little bit more about what we did with this tuner in order to get the gear mate working correctly. And we can talk a little bit about the, um, uh, we can talk a little bit about, hold on one second guys, there we go, get the chat up there. We can talk a little bit about the uh, motion study that I did on this as well. I know that there was a question about how we did this motion study here, so uh, I can definitely talk to you guys a little bit about how I did this. It uh, it worked out pretty good. You can see the way that it's cycling through here, going to transparent for one of those components and then coming back. The one thing I don't like about this motion study this and really this assembly in general is that I probably should have had the lock washer, which is this black part here uh, in between the, the tuner and the... Uh, nylon washer. I probably should have had the lock washer rotate with that. I think it would it would probably rotate with the tuner head. I'd have to actually look at one and see uh, see how it tunes, see how it turns when I go to turn it. But I think that would probably move together. But overall, I'm really happy with how this thing turned out. I think it came out great. I think the animation came out great. You guys saw that I used it on some social media. So I'll definitely show you guys today how I came up with that, how I was able to do that. Uh, I also, over the weekend, put together a tutorial on how to create this part. Uh, this is a spring using variable radius fillet. So, I'm sorry, variable radius uh, helix. So the, uh, really, I guess really it's variable pitch helix, not variable radius. The diameter stays the same all the way through. But uh, variable pitch helix in order to get a compression spring that has a flat at the top and a flat at the bottom. You know, if you were to purchase a spring like this, you would probably have one additional flattening uh, region on this thing. And what I mean is that you would probably end up with something like this, uh, where we take the top plane and drag it up maybe uh, half a diameter, and then we would lop that off. So we would do insert, cut with surface, and lop off that, uh, let's point that arrow down, the bottom of that thing uh, for the compression spring. And then we would kind of do the same thing up top so you would end up with something like this. I think that's kind of how uh, compression strings or springs are often finished depending on what size they are. But when you're working with a smaller compression spring, you don't really have that flat spot, you just have the wire diameter. Um, in order to create this, we did a helix and this helix uh, utilizes a variable pitch table. And so I created an IMG UR post with the images that I used to drive this design. So again, working from images, using the image here. Look how good this came out. This is a wireframe over top of the image. So those lines that are shown in blue there are the solid model. And then everything in the background here is just from that photograph. And look at how, how closely we were able to get that to align to that photograph. It's pretty, uh, 
pretty epic. Uh, so working with images, so I included those images, the image from the, the front, the image from the side, and then I also included an image of this table so that if you want to try to create this compression spring yourself using this variable uh, pitch table, you got all the information that you need. You just got to follow that video, which I posted this morning. So check it out if you haven't had a chance to check it out yet. Uh, and also speaking of checking stuff out, don't forget, you can uh, pick up uh, Too Tall Toby t-shirt they are the softest shirts in the cad game so uh be sure to uh pick up one of those shirts i know there's some people in the chat who have already bought this shirt and i'm sure that they will confirm that it is in fact the softest shirt in the cad game so this spring was inspired by the bridge section here uh of the the bass guitar project which is just kind of like my segue back into the bass guitar uh, and talking about what we're doing with the bass guitar here. You know, these springs here, multiple configuration springs. I was going to do multiple configurations in this tutorial, but then uh, uh, it just got to be too long. I think it ended up being like 15 minutes as it was. I didn't want to go any longer than that. Tambor Station says, can confirm softness. Thank you. Thank you, Tambor Station. Appreciate that. The shirts be soft. All right, so... Our goal today is going to be to get all four of the machine heads mounted on this thing. We're going to try and do this in the next 90 minutes. I think we can do it. We're pretty close to finishing the assembly of the, the first machine head. Uh, machine head is another term that you can use or that I use uh, for these tuners. Uh, I don't know if it is an official term or not. I don't know where I picked it up, but I'm pretty sure that it is an official term for these tuners. You can call them a machine head. You can call it a geared tuner. There's lots of... Uh, Lots of different things that you could call this, but uh, I call it a machine head. And so that's what we're going to call it during today's live stream. Let me just adjust this keyboard cam a little bit here. There we go. That looks better. Boom. Perfect. And now as soon as I did that, I'm going to end up just taking that away and uh, just going back to this view here just because uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to talk to you about uh, with regards to uh, how to set this thing up. So I'm using a camera view. I talked to you guys about camera views earlier in the uh, in the, the training sessions. But uh, here we can see this not using a camera view, not using perspective, looking at this thing dead on. And there's a couple of little tricks with the gear mate. So one of the first tricks uh, that I'll tell you that, um, you know, is extremely helpful is that the way that the gear mate works is you you define a rotational relationship between two components. So you say whenever this cylinder here rotates at a you know a certain number of rotations, we're gonna have this one rotate as well at a certain number of rotations. So uh, whenever this rotates one full rotation, this cylinder back here goes one full rotation. Well, this will go essentially one twentieth of a rotation. It'll go zero point zero five three uh, rotations. So that means that when we start uh, dragging, you know, this component around, it has to go around 20 times in order for this gear here to go around one time or vice versa. If I take this gear and I move it around one time, then we'll see the, the other components going around 20 times. So it works in both directions. The thing that's like a, a pro tip when it comes to the gear mate is that you can suppress the gear mate, move your components into position and then unsuppress the gear mate. And uh, the, 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 the components won't jump back to their original position, you know, position one, position two. So what I mean by that, and this is why this is important, is that once you feel like you've gotten pretty close to the correct gear ratio uh, within the mate, so as I'm moving this, like, yeah, that looks pretty good, but obviously it's not starting in the right spot. Well, you can just suppress this mate. So you come over to the tree, you right mouse button, you choose suppress, suppress that gear mate, and then you can move this component into the desired position. We can look at this, you know, kind of looking in more in the angle of the worm gear, move this into the desired position, and then you can unsuppress the gear mate and the components stay, you know, where they were after the move. And so that means that now we could start testing this and seeing, you know, are we getting the desired results from this thing? And I think that, you know, I think that we are. So that's a that's a pro tip that you definitely want to remember when it comes to the gear mates. You might, you know, especially if you already know what the teeth ratio is between the two components, like you already know what the correct ratio is. You just go in, you put in that that gear mate. Well, you might find that the components are are binding that that they are um, not really binding, but that they are inter interfering with one another. You can just suppress the gear mate, move the one component into place, then unsuppress the gear mate, and everything will still work. So that's pro move number one. Uh, pro move number two was. 
in order to determine what the pitch of the worm gear was, uh, what I did was I opened up this part here, and this is a little trick that I showed earlier in the live stream, but I'll show it to you again here. I needed to determine, you know, essentially what the center to center or common to common distance was between these two components here uh, at a, at a uh, consistent point. And so what I did was I just went to the top plane, begin a sketch, orient the view, and I sketched an arc. So we go um, S key, three point arc. And I created an arc that goes from this point on this tooth to the corresponding point on this tooth. And then I made that arc um, either, you know, co-radial or just kind of like closely lined it up to what we're seeing here on the, 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 the gear itself. So, you know, closely lined up to what we're seeing on the gear itself. And then I did smart dimension and I picked the arc and I picked the end point of the arc and I picked the other end point of the arc. And that gives me a dimension of 0 0.83. Uh, five zero zero point eight three five. Let's just call it zero point zero eight three five. Um, so what that means is that now I could go to the worm gear and I can examine the pitch of the worm gear. And I know that that's a variable pitch helix again, but I can examine that pitch and I can try to get that either equal to or very close to that same pitch. So I dial it down a little bit just through uh, some trial and error here. I dial it down to 0 0.079, but it should be pretty close to that dimension that we took. 0 0.0835 was the dimension we took. And then you can see here that this pitch is, is uh, you know di diving down to 0 0.079, but it should be pretty close if not exactly the same i mean in theory it should be exactly the same but you know we're, we're giving ourselves a little bit of tolerance here on this one but that's how i determined that pitch um you know we eyeballed it up last week we we worked with photographs but uh, now we were able to really get it dialed in um and then how did we you know uh validate that that measurement well we validated that measurement using the motion study uh in solidworks so Motion studies are super useful. They're available in every version of SolidWorks, but they're only available to do physical simulation testing in the higher level of SolidWorks in SolidWorks Premium. I utilize SolidWorks Professional, so I'm not gonna be able to get to that higher level of uh, capability, but I can certainly still do some cool stuff with motion studies, including uh, you know basic physical simulation. You can do uh, basic physical simulation between components using uh, motion study in SolidWorks. So in the case of this model here, uh, what I started out doing was I started out moving this component into place. You know, a cool trick that you can do in SolidWorks is you could take this tuner here and you could say, I want to take this tuner and I want to take its right, pl uh, sorry, uh, top plane, hold control, pick the uh, top plane of the assembly, let go of control, and I'm gonna go to mate, and I'm gonna mate those two together parallel, but down here in options, there's this option that says use for positioning only. You can already tell my voice is starting to, to blow out a little bit here. We got three full days of these live streams, so you know we wanna we wanna just uh, you know keep it uh, keep it real here for a little bit. So use for positioning only. And what that option does is it moves the component perfectly into place. So the uh, the tuning button is gonna be perfectly parallel. These two planes are gonna be perfectly parallel to one another, but it doesn't actually add the constraint. So I say use for positioning only and I hit the green check mark. And then uh, it, it adds that location, but it doesn't actually lock it in. So that's a good way to kind of, you know, get yourself started for, for example, for a motion study. One of the most frustrating things about doing a motion study is the uh, the function out. Actually, wait, wait, before I go on, let me just fix this issue that was bothering me anyway. Let me take this tuner button, mate of the parallel relationship to the top, the, the front plane of the assembly. I'm gonna edit that and I'm gonna change that from the front plane of the assembly to the uh, relationship to the tuner button. So the front plane of the tuner button. Uh, that way that uh, that lock washer will move with the the head. As the head turns, that lock washer will move too. I think they're supposed to move together. It's kind of a weird position of that thing. I'm gonna need to get another tuner and look at it. Uh, I'll have to look at it. I'm gonna say that they're supposed to move together. Uh, so, so now that we've got um, the the gear mate, you know, and we feel like the gear. Oh, oh, sorry, that was the last thing I wanted to mention. How did we get the the ratio of the the rotation like one to twenty? We just counted the teeth. 
uh, pretty simple, pretty simple, uh, you know, explanation there. So one tooth here, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, right? So I thought it was actually going to be 20, one to 20 uh, for that, for that uh, go around. But, uh, you know, it's an iterative process as well. So, you know, we counted that, that gave us 19, uh, 20, you know, so it would be like one over 19, see what that ratio is, and then uh, start adjusting slightly just by examining, moving the thing around, examining, moving the thing around. And eventually you'll be able to get it dialed in the way that I got it dialed in there. A little counter uh, uh, or uh, anticlimactic, right? The uh, I was hoping that was going to go right up to 20. <laughs> All right, so... So now uh, we go to, so now we've got our gear meet in place. We've got our components in the right positions. We may want to take a moment and organize our view so that it looks correct because when you create a motion study, what you're going to find is that you are going to lock in the current view. So I'll show you how that works as well. So I come down here to one of these tabs, motion study five, motion study one, and I say create new motion study. So when I go to create the new motion study, everything in the current view layout gets kind of locked in. Uh, all of the the uh, geometry in the current view study, its its orientation, it all gets locked in. Now, if I take this this uh, time bar here at the top and I move this time bar over, and then I rotate the view, so I just rotated the view here to a new location, and then I go to this line right here, orientation and camera view, and I go to this location that I just moved the time bar to, what I can do is I can right mouse button right at that location and I can say place key. And so now if I play this animation from the beginning, it'll look like this. Goes right with this music. So if we wanted to uh, make that, you know, a little bit more dynamic, what we could do is we could take this first key here. So every what I'm trying to teach you is that everything that's in this line right here has to do with the camera orientation, the camera zoom, the camera rotation, uh, even like perspective settings uh, can be, I think, included in that. So um, so everything is, you know, that has to do with the camera view is in there. So if you're ever wondering like, hey, how come every time I go to start a new animation, it takes me back to this view? It's because you have a key there in that view uh, that doesn't look, you know, that, that's that's locking the current view orientation. So if we wanted to make that a little more dynamic, we could take this view, we could say um, copy, we can move forward a little bit, we could say paste, we could take this view, we could say copy, we can move back a little bit, we could say paste. And now what'll happen is when we start the animation, it starts out in this view, then it begins to rotate to the new view, then it stops rotating, and the timeline continues for the remainder of whatever's going on in the timeline. So that's camera view orientation. Uh, it's very important. It can be very frustrating if you don't understand how the camera view orientation works and you're trying to do a motion study. You can be like, what, what is going on? Uh, there are three different types of motion studies that you can create in SolidWorks. They're listed here, animation or basic motion. And then the third one is what's called a... Um, motion analysis i think that's what it's called um which is like your simulation motion so you've got your i'll try to see if I, I can't really move the view over sorry guys but you've got animation basic motion and then you've got your uh, motion simulation as the third one which will only be available if you turn on the add-in for motion study which you will only have if you have uh solidworks premium or one of the simulation packages so um, we're just gonna do this as a basic animation, but the cool thing is if you get into basic motion, then you can start doing things like uh, having parts collide with one another and implementing gravity and stuff like that, uh, which is pretty cool. This is just a basic animation here and uh, we don't need the camera to change at all. So I'm gonna delete all these keys. So delete that key there, delete that final key there and delete this first key here. I don't need the camera to move at all. So now what I'm going to do is in the motion study toolbar, I'm going to add a motor. And the only reason this motor is going to work is because the assembly can currently move. It has, you know, it has degrees of freedom in the assembly. So I'm going to grab this motor here and I'm going to say that I want this motor to be applied to this face here and I want it to be a rotary motor. Now. The reality is that I actually applied it in the in the uh, animation that I made. I actually applied it to this face here. 
And the reason why is because I had the housing shown. And so if I'm gonna apply it to that face, I'm gonna rotate it about something. I need to declare what it's rotating about. And so I rotated it about the axis that we created for mating. So here's the axis that we created for mating. And now this thing is gonna rotate. If I want it to go forward or backward, I can change the direction here. And then for my speed, I'll say that I want that to spin at uh, 30 rotations per minute. And I hit the green check mark and SOLIDWORKS adds in this motor. It's gonna start here at the zero second mark. It's gonna go out to four seconds. So I'm gonna say calculate and SOLIDWORKS is gonna go through and calculate that uh, motion assembly. It's pretty choppy in my opinion. It's very like, ch -ch 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 -ch. well, why is it so choppy? Because here in the options for the motion study, I'm saying to solve this thing at eight frames per second. Now in, uh, United States Broadcasting Television, I believe that the standard is between 25 and 30 frames per second. So if you wanted to kind of stick to that, it's a good rule, you do 30 frames per second. It's pretty common in uh, modern uh, video, you know, computerized video editing, 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second are pretty common as well. So uh, 30 frames per second is a good one. And now if I calculate again, you notice it's a much smoother run. It's a much smoother animation. Now, let's say I wanted to use this to validate my gear ratio. What I might do is I might run this thing out to like 10 seconds, and then um, I might do a space bar and go to a top view. So I'm looking down directly on this thing or maybe a bottom view, so I'm looking up directly uh, on this thing from the bottom. And then I would go to, remember, I wanna go to this key right here, and I want to say replace key or update key because right now this key is a different view. And so if I leave it alone, if I don't do anything, and then I say um, recalculate this study, see, look, it wants to jump back to that uh, original orientation. This can be very frustrating for people who don't work with motion studies a lot, which is why I'm beating it up here for you guys. So I go to a, let's say bottom view of this thing, and then I right mouse button here on the, uh, the starting view. I right mouse button and I say replace key and that's going to update that very first key with the current view orientation uh, that I'm that I'm seeing on the screen here. I'm going to drag this thing out to say 10 seconds and I'm going to say calculate and what I'm looking for here is a, a validation, a basic validation of whether or not I got my gear ratio correct, whether or not I got my uh, my pitch correct, you know, does this thing let me rotate all the way around? Maybe I'll take it out to 20 seconds and do the same test. Or maybe I'll increase the rotations per minute in that, um, uh, in that um, motor that I created. So I'm just looking here to see, you know, if I had the gear ratio incorrect, then what would happen is the, the you know, I wouldn't have this nice alignment here right at the center of the, the gear. I could even zoom in here and right mouse button on this view key, which is currently zoomed way out. And I could say replace key. And then I could play this animation from the start, from the beginning. And I could watch it and say, you know, yeah, that looks pretty good. It looks like that gear is kind of like binding on the very first pass there. Maybe I want to... Um, uh, reset the the beginning you know location like what I showed you guys before suppress the gear mate you know move the gear a little bit unsuppress the gear mate the main thing you want to know about motions motion studies and animations and stuff in SolidWorks is that a lot of times you've loaded it up with kind of uh, uh, changes you've made some changes to it you, you, the positions of your components etc uh, it can be frustrating and so if that's the case just start all over again I'll show you an example of what I mean. Let me go back to the model now. So here I'm looking at the model view and I'm gonna to go to a, uh, a bottom view of this thing. Uh, so control six, that's one that I don't use that often. I'm gonna to go to that gear mate. So let's take our gear mate here. And I'm going to right mouse button uh, suppress, excuse me, I'm gonna right mouse button suppress that gear mate. And I'm gonna move this into a new position. Now I'm intentionally moving this into a position where things are interfering with one another just to illustrate a, a point here that I'm gonna make. So I moved that component into place. Now I'm gonna go back to my motion study and look at the motion study. It moved that gear back over. So the motion study down here in the, in the motion study uh, tree, it remembers the location of all of your components as they were at, at the state of this key here. See, each one of these diamonds is a key. I showed you guys how the key works for the uh, orientation and camera view. Well, each one of these is also locking in the position and the color and the transparency setting and the wireframe versus uh, hidden lines visible versus solid, uh, like all the visual settings, the color that you apply to it, all that stuff is being stored 
stored in these little diamonds here in these little keys and uh sometimes you're better off just starting anew rather than trying to work with an existing motion study so you know if if i'm looking at this and i'm like this isn't what i wanted i wanted it to be interfering the best thing I could do would be to go back to my model tab and then right mouse button here and say, create a new motion study. And then look at this motion study. It starts out with that interference uh, the way that we want it. I know we don't really want that, but um, yeah, just kind of like a, a good good little pro tip to know about. So I'm gonna delete uh, that mo that new motion study that I created. I'm gonna delete the other one that I created a moment ago. Um, it says, you know, do you wanna update the initial animation state on this one? I'm gonna say no. I'm gonna return to my assembly. I'm gonna suppress that gear mate. I'm gonna move this guy into place here. Again, it might be good to look at this from an end view, something like this. Move that guy into place. And then I'm going to uh, shift tab to show the the housing tab shift tab to show the housing there we go um and now the housing is shown as well i'm going to get myself to kind of a cool view for the animation i also did something here with the shadows um if i look at this thing in a standard isometric view it looks like this because everything was modeled on the top plane well if you go into your scene settings and you edit your scene you can control where the floor is so i made a new plane that i wanted to be the floor because i knew i was going to be animating it in this point of view and i wanted the shadows to look cool in the animation and then the final thing that I did was I created a camera view. So I've got this camera one, which is a camera view. That is extremely helpful when you're working with animations, creating a camera view. Uh, but for this example, I'm gonna go back to the previous view. Uh, I'll just say an isometric view and rotate it around like this, just to kind of show you guys uh, the use of zooming when you are creating a motion study. So this looks pretty good. I'm gonna right mouse button, create a new motion study. Wait, did I unsuppress that gear mate? Hold on, let me just make sure I unsuppressed it. I did not. Okay, let me delete this. Again, uh, a lot of times it's better just to delete and restart rather than trying to figure out like, where's the key for that gear mate? I gotta unsuppress it now. So right mouse button, create new motion study. Uh, let's, let's take a look at this thing. That looks good. I like that view. Let's create a new, uh, uh, sorry, let's go to our options in the motion study. In the options, let's change this to 30. What's up, Josh? Welcome to the party. Thanks for joining us today. Josh Campbell in the chat. Now that we've uh, started a new motion study, let's go to our um, rotary motor. So motor, rotary motor on this component, rotating about this axis, the axis that I created for mating, rotating in the opposite direction and at an RPM of 30 RPM. Let's hit the green check mark for that motor. Let's do a calculate study, calculate animation. Kind of get this thing started. Muffin Fuzz, Brandon is in the chat. What's up, what's up, what's up? Welcome, welcome. All right, so that's looking pretty good. Um, we can roll this thing out to a longer duration and calculate the rest of it. Look at that thing going through. Tayfun is here. What's up, Tayfun? Welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Good night, Australia. All right. Good morning, US. Good night, Australia. So now what we're going to do is we're going to um, create a dynamic view change. So we will just zoom in a little bit here like so, rotate the view slightly, and then right mouse button on uh, the, the orientation camera view, and we'll say place key. And let's do what we did before. Let's copy this and paste it. And let's copy this new key that we created and we'll paste it here. And then let's copy the original location and paste that at the end. And that way we get a camera view orientation change like this. So we zoom in, things rotate a bit. I think that looks good. Good afternoon, South Africa. Brandon, nice, nice. And then finally, let's just add a little bit of a dynamic hide. Uh, I did this in the social media posts on this thing. So we can go to this component. You can see it shows up here and we can, I like to go out to the timeline and we can write, uh, I'm sorry, go to the component here in the, in the uh, property manager and we can right click and we can say uh, appearance. And if we expand this menu, there's also an option here for change transparency. 
So we take the first key where everything is solid. We do a copy. We move into the timeline a bit. We do a right mouse button paste. That's where it's going to begin to become transparent. We take this guy and move it over here. That's where it's going to end being transparent. Uh, let's take the overall timeline and just drag it out to 20 seconds. Give us a little bit more room to, to navigate here. Okay, now it is completely transparent. Let's copy that key. Let's paste that key here at 12 seconds. And here is the completely solid key. Let's copy that key. Let's paste that here at 16 seconds. And so let's calculate this thing and see what it looks like. So we start out in this view. We zoom in. We change the, the housing here to transparent. We let everybody enjoy that transparency for a few moments. We rotate out while it is becoming solid again. Boom. We take a capture of that. We put on social media. We get a million views, become viral. We get a bunch of sponsors, start collecting, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a month, you know, buying a bunch of land, buying up some properties, setting up some rental properties, become a landlord, take on a bunch of tenants, you know, hope that they pay their rent on time. Maybe you have to kick some people out. Maybe not, you know, we'll see how it goes. But that's basically the plan. I mean, it all starts with learning how to do animations in SolidWorks. So... And that's how IG works. That's right. Josh knows it. Josh knows the social media game. Cool. So that's a little bit of a discussion there of animations. If you've never done an animation before, that's a good way to do it. Um, I'll tell you, you know, from personal experience, my my experience is that if you try to export this thing, if you try to use Animation Wizard and export this thing, it's uh, it's not been for me, or sorry, not Animation Wizard, the save animation. It has not been for me a, a good experience uh, trying to export this. You know, you guys can let me know if maybe you've had a better experience with trying to export your animations. Um, I don't have a good experience with it. So what I usually do is use uh, Camtasia or some other third party to just capture whatever's on screen. I've had some good luck with animating out to the photo view 360 rendering buffer. So it renders each frame and it animates it out, but it takes a long time to do that. And I've had weird stuff happen. Like when I'm creating an animation, if I bring anything else up on the screen, like I'm running the animation in the background and, and exporting it. And then I uh, bring up something else in the foreground, like um, uh, paint.net to do some photo editing. When I watch the, the recording playback, some of those frames of what I was doing in the photo editing software show up in the animation in the MP4. So, you know, take that for what it is. I haven't had that much luck. I have a much better time just exporting it uh, using a screen capture and then dumping that into my social media feeds. So that's it for my speech on animation. Nice little 30 minute free lesson there on how to work with animation in SolidWorks. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Let's get into creating some more components for this assembly. Um, oh, you know what I forgot to look at was the... Uh, how does that um, lock washer look now? Is it rotating around? Oh yeah, I like that way more. Look at that thing. Yes, I like that way more. Way, way, way more. Oh, and then this component here, the black uh, worm gear component, you know, we have the physical part, obviously, the, the black worm gear component, uh, physical part. Whoops, put this down here. Josh had a great idea. Uh, he messaged me about this. And he said, maybe if you put like a, a white, some kind of white piece of paper in the background here. Uh, then when you hold components down here in the mouse cam view, be easier to see those components. I think that was an excellent suggestion. Uh, the way that I got this component to, to look as good as it looks is by applying a material of, gosh, I can't even remember what material I did apply here. What was this? Black satin finish plastic. That's what I used there. Black satin finish plastic. Uh, and that came out really good. So uh, definitely a recommended material uh, if you're trying to get a good view here from SolidWorks. Uh, black, black satin plastic finish. I thought that came out really good. All right, guys. Um, between, whoops, this isn't the correct overlay. Hold on a second. Tutorials overlay. There we go. Wrong overlay. 
buy some t-shirts. Uh, between all the coffee I was drinking and me slamming that water, I do uh, once again have to take a quick bio break. So we'll be right back. Uh, be sure to talk amongst yourselves and uh, go refill that coffee. Robert, I know you want to go refill that coffee as well. So we'll be right back, guys. Uh, enjoy the music here for just a few minutes. some uh i got some orange juice too so let's see if that affects my my voice in a positive way orange juice call orange juice in one hand coffee in the other all right guys if you like orange juice and coffee be sure to hit that like button so that we can get as much coffee and orange juice as we need and with that let's get into the continued creation of this tuner. Remember, our goal today is to create all four of these tuners, which means we're going to need to do a mirrored component uh, for this one so that we can do the left and right. And then we're going to have to go through and remate everything in that mirrored version. We could, of course, create just a mirrored version in the assembly. Maybe we'll try that and see if we can't uncover uh, a top secret way of, 
of uh, simplifying that process. All right, so the next component that we're going to create is going to be the um, I think this is a, what's officially called the tuning peg. This guy here. Shout out to Josh for the excellent idea of leveraging the mouse cam to show off some of these components uh, much better than what I was doing before. So let's use the uh, the same process that we've been using to to uh, create this component. Remember, we've been working a lot with photos throughout this entire series, so we're going to just continue doing that, uh, working with the photos of the bass guitar. And the main photo that we're, we're working with today is... Let me bring this up here in a second. Oops, sorry, hold on, guys. I'm looking at the wrong one. There we go. Is this photo here. So we took a, a picture of everything, kind of like a, a sem assembly exploded view of everything. So we've got this little screw down here, the 608, uh, which is the pinion screw uh, gear gear screw and then uh, we've got this larger component up here the 610 tuning post so we're going to create those components now uh, and then we will be ready to start assembling this thing we also have this little cover plate that goes on the bottom that's just a simple disc that's gonna be a piece of cake I just want to say overall uh, it's great to be back you know I uh, I've been missing doing this kind of work with you guys and I'm glad glad to be back very glad to be back so uh, let's get into it here. Let's go to our toolbox. Uh, let's bring in our anti-inch component here. This is going to be a screw. It's going to be a countersunk screw, probably a machine countersunk screw. Uh, we can drag and drop one of these components in here, either 82 degrees or 100 degrees. I don't know which one is it's going to be for this, so I'm just going to kind of pick one here. Uh, and we'll say that this is a little bit of a larger size than what we're seeing there, like a 1032. Nah, it looks a little too big. Let's go 832. Yep, that looks pretty good. And then for the length here, uh, the length is pretty short. Let's use our caliper here, zero this thing out, and make sure that we're in inches. And it looks like our length is 0.3125. Okay, and we will divorce that from toolbox a little bit later. I'll probably do that off stream. And that way we can turn it into just a standalone part and get it to be uh, the correct you know, the correct part for this. Um, this is going to be spinning with the gear uh, because of how it's screwed into that uh, that other component. So you can always do lock rotation. There's nothing wrong with using lock rotation. I usually do it as, a, um, as an explicit mate rather than doing lock rotation, um, but there's, there's nothing wrong with doing it either way. It's fine to do it either way. All right, now we're going to do a new part. This is going to be from our bass guitar template. It's going to be a part in inches. And uh, let's just make sure that we're being consistent here. This is the top view. So we're going to create this part on the front plane, begin to sketch, orient the view. And this part is going to be uh, laid out here with a... Looks like it's going to be a line that comes over kind of for the flat spot. It's going to be... A line that comes up, then a line that comes over for the diameter, a line that comes up, then a line that comes over for the overall diameter, and then a line that comes up, and then there's going to be kind of like an arced shape here. Uh, this is for the, the tuning peg head. I don't know if that arc is going to become vertical to itself. We'll, we'll kind of feel this out as we go. And then this arc here will be spherical. So we'll make this point and this point and the origin all vertical to one another. And then we will create a center line going down through here. And then we will create a diameter center line as well. This is one of these examples where we can use our initial sketch. So what I just sketched there was supposed to essentially represent this geometry here, the geometry of the, the tuning peg. So you can see it's got a flat spot at the bottom. You can sort of see that flat spot there at the bottom. Um, and then it's got these uh, arcs up top. So I'm creating the geometry for this tuning peg here. And now I'm going to create or, or uh, establish some basic dimensions of that tuning peg. So that's going to be the diameter at the, the largest diameter and then the overall length of this thing. So the overall length here is 1.40. So we'll go in, we'll add that smart dimension, 1.40. 
and we'll create a smart dimension that goes to the center line and comes across with a diameter of, let's say, 0 0.3345. And what that does for me is it sets me up now so that I can use that image, which is like my initial sketch, to size the photo. This is something that we haven't really done yet, but we've done a very similar workflow several times so far. So um, at this point, just give me one second. Let me just make sure that I'm in the correct folder here for this. Tools, sketch tools, sketch picture. Okay, and I am not in the correct folder. So let's get into the correct folder here and give me one second, guys. I'll share my screen again. Oh, did I not take a picture of that part explicitly? That's interesting. It looks like I did not. Huh. It's like I made a mistake here, guys. Let me look at my... Uh, uh, I'm just going to bring in a picture of something else just to lock the folder location in, and then I'll delete that picture, and then we'll we'll take a look at this together. Sorry, I know I'm not I'm not sharing my screen right now. It's just because I don't want to um, I don't want to inadvertently show something that I'm not supposed to. So just bear with me a second, guys, and we will we'll get right back into it here. That's the spring. Okay, so these are the, the raw photos that I took of all the components of the bass guitar. There you can see I'm uh, trying to utilize a, a white background as I'm uh, capturing this information. And I, I know that looks like a funny symbol. Uh, maybe a symbol some of you guys know about. It was not intended to be that. I was just using the fingers from the glove there to uh, try to hold the part in a, a orthogonal view, essentially, using that for height uh, for the component. Uh, so I'm just kind of looking through here to see if I have a clean shot of the, the tuning peg. There I'm using the ledger to kind of hold the hold things in place. See, it looks like that might be the cleanest shot that I have. Yeah, I don't really have a good one other than that. So I guess this is going to be our, uh, this is going to be the one that we're going to use. So we're going to say, um, I mean, we could just drop this whole picture in. I just don't like to drop the entire picture in because you end up uh, with like very large, unnecessarily large files. So this is definitely not the best image of this thing. The good news is that, you know, it's a, it's a relatively simple part and so we can use measurements, but if it was a more complicated part, then at this point I would consider maybe uh, reshooting, you know, redoing the photo shoot and trying to get a better image of this thing where I'm looking at it a little bit more dead on. It's not quite uh, a dead on view here, so. Let's take this guy. So what we're doing here is we're establishing a vertical line and we're using that to uh, position this thing. Wish I had more contrast between the, the physical part and that background. It's hard to tell like what's a shadow and what's part of the physical part. You have to, you have to kind of use this area down here at the bottom to determine it. So I'll, I'll try to clean that up as well here before we go back into SolidWorks. So I'm just dropping that in there so that it's vertical or pretty close to vertical in the photograph. And then, um, like I said, I'm gonna just, just do a little bit of touch up here in uh, the photo editing software to try to get this to be uh, a little bit easier to see where the edge of the part is. So I'm just gonna make a very small line that starts down here and comes up vertical and a small line that starts here and comes up vertical uh, right along the part. You know, similarly, I could create an arc here that just traces the physical part just in black uh, because it's hard to see you know where the physical part starts and stops with that white paper background and this is uh again this doesn't make me feel very comfortable uh you know doing it this way i would much rather have clean geometry uh from the start you know a clean photograph i don't like the way i'm looking in on the end here like this so if this part was any more complicated i i wouldn't do it this way i would uh i would do it the right way uh, but i'm gonna make an exception here because i think that this is su such simple geometry that i can physically measure uh, that it's not gonna make or break the project 
So we're going to do a save as here. Again, just bear with me. Make sure that I'm uh, saving this into the correct location. Drop this into the 1212 base giveaway. And this is going to be photos of base. And we're going to call this one... 60 oh, 610 tuning post so 610 tuning post from top probably didn't need the number in that one but tuning post from top from top from front whatever okay so let's take a look at that uh image that we just created that we just captured and bring that in and drop it in here so tools sketch tools Sorry, we're going to begin a new sketch on the front plane. So front plane, begin a sketch, orient our view, tools, sketch tools, sketch picture. And we're going to go down to that uh, tuning post. There we go. And we're going to take this and, you know, use it to help determine the, what was it, 0.380 or something like that? I forget what it was exactly. Uncheck that option for enable scale tool. And then we can resize this just by grabbing the edge of it resizing this down like so resizing this up to the height of our uh you know max height of our design which looks to be about there and that should get us pretty close to what we're trying to accomplish with that uh with that sketch a lot of times i'll go in here and i'll say i want this to be full image transparency hit the green check mark and uh then i can reorder this because this original sketch here, instead of it just being a layout, it's actually gonna be our driving geometry for the rest of the model, you know, for our first feature, really. So now I can edit that sketch since it's the second sketch in a row, and I can use that to help uh, populate some of these dimensional values. So I'm using the image to help get me close, kind of help get me started, and then I will take the physical measurements off of the part to really lock everything in. So, you know, the biggest thing that I'm getting from the image is the, you know, maybe the location of this arc here, what this arc should look like, where the peak is, things like that. So now that that looks pretty close, I'm ready to start taking the, the physical measurements off the part. We've got our, uh, it's kind of nice, this, this first section is revolved and then has the flat spot in it. So it's got a diameter of 0 0.233, and then the next diameter is 0 0.255. So 0 0.233, 0 0.255, nice and easy to remember as well. So this here is 0 0.233, and this one is 0 0.255. And then I could take another dimension here off of that peak of the where the arcs are. So that looks to be about... 0 0.334, so pretty much the same as the uh, lower diameter there. Interesting, the picture shows it flaring out more than that, but I think that that uh, could just be, you know, bad, took it at a bad angle or maybe, you know, it's slightly, you know, it's still slightly uh, off center. So again, we're, we're relying more on the physical dimensions, especially since this image uh, is, questionable uh, it wasn't really taken at a proper angle or anything like that so diameter to the middle of that arc so i did a, a hold shift there to get that 0 0.2625 0 0.2625 and um you know for the arc radius or for this distance here i really just have to kind of eyeball it up and say it's like 0 0.050 50 thou get down to there and um what else we got here? Why is this still blue? Oh, distance to this point here. This one I'll take from the bottom. I think it'll be easier to measure from the bottom. And that's gonna be at uh, 0 0.999. Cool. All right, that gets us our first shape. Just need to get some uh, final heights here. You can use a depth gauge on your caliper to get these final heights. 0 0.216 and 0 0.1315 that's that step see and as we add those dimensions in they kind of like lock right into the photo that's what we like to see nice little confirmation there that our photo is good uh, or the sort of good <laughs> not the best that's for sure um features revolve and we'll revolve that peg around like so. 
and then we can go front plane, begin a sketch, orient our view, and we can say that at the very bottom of that thing, there are two flat spots, and those two flat spots are at 0 0.1925. So we can go to this uh, corner here, drag this up to here, create a center line, mirror that geometry about the center line. This is a little trick to know about when you're working with photos, also a good reason to crop your photos. You can't window, window drag when you're in a sketch, so you can see my left mouse button here is attempting to uh, click and drag. <clears throat> my left mouse button is attempting to click and drag, but it's not working, and that's because the photo is in the background. So if I grab this guy here outside of the photo, click and drag, then I can window select that and mirror it, uh, but inside the photo I can't, so it's good to know uh, that little trick, and that's a good reason to justify taking a moment, cropping your photos in your photo editing software before you actually bring them into SolidWorks. Josh Campbell, I struggle wanting to round to the nearest nominal when doing measurements or just use what I measured, uh, just my own personal fight. Yeah, yeah, there's, you know, this is, we get into kind of the nuance of some of this stuff and it gets to be a little bit, uh, you know, I mean, just the nature of nuance, right? It's going to be a little nitty gritty. You're going to have some uh, arguments to be made for both techniques. So uh, I get what you're saying. You know, it's... It depends on what the application is, right? If you're doing something that needs to be within plus or minus, you know, 0 0.2 millimeters, then you're gonna, you know, you're gonna need to be a lot more accurate than if you're just trying to create something, a, a cool data set, you know, that people can use for uh, some kind of a demonstration. Oops, that was the other dimension. So I'm gonna use tab here, 0 0.0965. And then I'll go to this one here, the depth of that cut. And again, this might be easier to just to measure from the bottom of the part so 1.101 I like these nice round dimensions so 1.101 there we go and then this is going to be tangent to this and right mouse button select midpoint hold control pick the origin and make this vertical that's a good quick easy way to center that right mouse button through all both directions right mouse button again and that is a tuning peg. We'll make this out of plain carbon steel. And as we've been talking about, sometimes it's good to uh, get in here and just make the material look slightly different. So like this is a steel, maybe we'll make this out of a, you know, instead of a polished steel, we'll make it a, a burnished steel. You know, you got the, uh, the different options here to try to create a little bit of variety in your components as they are being assembled. And so at this point, we could do a control S to save this. We're gonna call this one RBG dash 610 dash tuning post. Tuning post. And then we'll do a check in active document to check this into our data management system. Always good to work with data management and to give yourself a, record, a running record of uh, what you've done with the uh, with the components along the way. And so now we can hide that sketch, that's image, uh, front view. This is the main, main shape. This is the flat spots on the bottom. This is the rect cut for string. And now from the bottom, there is a tapped hole so we could either do this with whole wizard or we could just do it with a cut extrude. Um, we've talked in, in as the uh, series has been going on, we've talked about the pros and cons of both. So I'm just gonna do it with a cut extrude here, 0 0.1340 and extrude cut that. And I don't know how deep that's gonna go, but I know that the other one was only 0.3125, the, the screw that goes into that. So I could probably make that uh, 0 0.25. I may all make it. 3125 as well just to just for consistency there and then there is a through all hole that goes all the way up through the bottom the rest of the way um, and that has a diameter of it's almost exactly the same as the peg so I'll call it uh, 90 thou so 0 0.090 and that is gonna go through all so this will be called tap hole in bottom and this is going to be called a uh, through hole i'll call this one small through hole. ok 
Okay, and so renaming your features, always a good practice. Uh, make sure you, you take the time to do that. It'll help you, it'll help your coworkers, it'll help the world. Uh, right mouse button, check an active document. Now this is going in at revision two. And let's create a mate reference on this thing to make our life a little bit easier in the assembly. Uh, in the assembly, we can see that this is gonna get mated into, looks like this, I could probably made it right onto this edge right here. Uh, so that is where the, this is the, pin, the that small gear, that pinion gear. And this thing mates into that. Let me see, it kind of snaps in. So, so looks like it's going to be, I'll leave this here so you guys can see it. Looks like it's going to be um, this edge here, which will be the candidate for the mate reference. This is an edge which shares a cylinder and a planar face. And this is an edge which shares a cylinder and a planar face. So that seems like that would be a great candidate. So I'll pick that edge there, S key, reference geometry, mate reference, hit the green check mark, control S to save that model, close that model, R key, grab that component, drag and drop it in, and it just snaps right into place. I mean, that is what we want from our workflow. That is epic, it's perfect, it's just what we want. So now the only thing left to do here is to mate those two faces parallel to one another. So I will do a right mouse button, select other. And now every face that I right mouse button on will become transparent. And that will allow me to select this face here uh, of the tuning tuner pinion, so the gear. Um, and now I'm gonna mate that. And that's gonna get mated to, let's hide this component, to this flat spot. And those are gonna be parallel and we'll hit the green check mark. And then we can show that uh, tuner pinion again. And let's see what we got here. Is, the, is it magic? It is. It is indeed magic. Yes, this is what we wanted. Cool, very, very cool. So what other components do we have for this thing? We got, that's 10. We got uh, nine, which is the pinion gear cover, which is just a simple disc. Uh, very simple here. So this guy is just gonna be diameter. Oh boy. Oh boy. We're gonna lose it in the keyboard. It's gonna be a diameter here of 0 0.5965 and a wall thickness of 0 0.0370. And that's going to be on the top plane. So new part, an inch. Top plane, begin to sketch, orient the view, and circle. 0 0.5965. S-key extrude, 0 0.0375. Material, plain carbon steel. And uh, save, control S for save. And that's going to go into uh, RBG. 609 tuner gear cover plate and we are going to select this edge well we can do it with this edge here s key reference geometry mate reference hit the green check mark to use the default remember those mate references are powerful and very easy to apply check an active document which will both save and check in this active document close that model let's show the housing here and R key, grab that plate, drag, drop, put our mouse over it. Look at that, how it just snaps right into place. Now, how cool is that? If you, if you like that functionality of mate references, be sure to smash that like button. Be sure to left click on that like button. All right, that takes care of part number nine and part number 10. Let's move on now to part number 11, the hex bushing, hex bushing. This is a part that uh, I just use a part similar to this in my last uh, thumbnail for 
the Model Monday Live, the hex pushing type part. So pretty straightforward. I mean, you could, you could, if you wanted to, you could get into a little bit of complexity on the bottom of this thing, but I don't think we even really need a photo or anything for this. We just need to start modeling. So my kind of model. Let's just get in and start modeling. We don't need anything. So new part, part in inches, uh, top plane, begin a sketch, orient the view, and we will start with a hex sketch here. Make one of these horizontal and determine what the flat to flat distance is, which looks to be about 0 0.5860. 0 0.586. Okay, and then we can do S key extrude, and we're gonna bring this down to a depth of 0 0.1. And we'll reverse that. We want that to be going in the uh, downward direction. And then we are going to, um, what we can do here is we can create uh, some layout geometry for the revolve cut. It's a little hard to see uh, on this part, but there is a revolve cut going around the outside of this, which uh, is clearly generating some, uh, some geometry that we can leverage. So, you know, when you're creating a revolve cut around a, uh, a hex you can sit there and, and take a bunch of time and measure out exactly where that cut revolve is supposed to be but what i think is a much more elegant solution is just to make a circle on the top of that hex and make that circle tangent to the hex and then exit that sketch and then go to front plane begin a sketch orient your view and then pierce to that circle with your triangular cut sketch so we're going to create a sketch that looks like this so we can lop off the corners of that hex well just take this and pierce it Boom, now you know exactly where that's supposed to go. And then, you know, whatever that angle is, that let's say it's 20 degrees. Um, and then you just make a center line here and you do features revolved cut. And that gives you that cool kind of like rounded off area of the head of a hex, whether that's a hex bolt or it's this hex sleeve thing, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. Josh has several web meetings coming up. Y'all have fun, and I'll rewatch this evening. See you later, Josh. Good seeing you in here, bro. So that's, yeah, that's a, a real quick, easy way to create a hex head. Um, if you're ever wondering how they get that shape, uh, that's an easy way to do it. Just draw a circle in there first, a layout sketch for a circle. Um, this thing does have some uh, kind of interesting geometry going down the, the inside of the shaft here. It looks... I mean, we could spend a lot of time working on that. I think I'm just gonna do it with a chamfer once I create the cut extrude. So I'm not gonna worry about that for now. Let's go to the outside geometry, uh, which is the threaded geometry. And that's gonna be at 0 0.462 for the diameter. So select face, begin to sketch, orient the view. This is gonna be 0 0.462. And then I'm gonna blast this right through the existing geometry. So reverse direction. So it's going down through the existing geometry. And then that is going to be at a diameter of 0 0.607. Uh, sorry, length, 0 0.607. There we go. And now we can create our through hole. That is going to have a through hole of 0 0.3395. Probably supposed to be something a little more nominal uh, through all. Okay, and then I'm gonna throw a chamfer on the end of that. Uh, it It's hard to explain what is going on here. So I'll just say it's gonna have a chamfer like that. And that might be too much. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's basically what's going on there. It's also, it also looks like it's filleted. That's what we want, a nice 15 thou fillet on the end of our part. That's going to really help with our performance in assembly mode, right? <laughs> what did we say this one was? 611? 611, hex bushing. Tuner, hex bushing. All right, and we are... Oh, I forgot to put in the um, the thread, the, the pseudo thread. So let's add a little pseudo thread here. this one remember when it comes to you know creating things like thread uh you can you can certainly do it as a helix you can do it as a cosmetic thread 
you can do it the way that I'm doing it here, which is to just create a representation of the thread uh, so that if somebody is looking at it, you know, they know what they're looking at. They know that this is supposed to be the thread for the uh, for the hex nut that goes up top. It's it's not uh, necessary to go too crazy with this, but if you're going to be doing a rendering or anything like that, you do want it to be represented in a way that people can just look at it. If you're doing instruction manuals, that's another case study that we talked about. You're going to want to make sure that people know what they're what they're looking at uh, when they see this. So. So just making it something nominal so that it's easy to pattern after I create the revolve cut. And then I can take that revolve cut and I can say linear pattern in this direction. Remember, you can pick a dimension for your pattern direction. Make that 40 thou and just pattern that down to the end. Look at that. It worked out perfect. It even gave me a nice, nice chamfer on the end. I like it. All right. Okay. I think that's pretty much it for that part. Uh, let's save that. Ricardo J in the house. What's up, Ricardo? Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Let's do a check and active document. Add that to our overall PDM project. Let's uh, assign a material. Plain carbon steel. Let's go to uh, main hex shape. Uh, this is the layout for head corner cuts. This is the hex head corner cuts this is the main sleeve this is the red one the red pattern uh, main through hole uh, through hole small chamfer control a control c and the through hole small fillet. And I didn't mean to turn on my quick snaps and save. Got and then this part of um, this part, its location is going to be based on the wall thickness of the the head. Uh, this part is kind of uh, squeezed between the head and the rest of the tuner. Uh, so it's going to go on here. It's going to have some dimension like uh, zero point six one one. Uh, but it's going to be based on the the way that this whole thing goes together. So what I mean by that is, here's the housing. Here's the housing. The pinion gear and the tuner peg go into that housing. They come up here through the bottom of that. Actually, the, the gear goes in. The gear goes in through the bottom and the, the, the pinion head goes up from here through the top. Um, I should look at that in the sub-assembly. And then this, this guy here gets threaded into that housing. So you end up with this. And then as you're threading that down, you compress these two together. So this should be about uh, 0.611 plus, I think there's a washer that goes in between them as well. So there's, yeah, there's this bushing washer here. And that bushing washer goes yeah, on the top underneath that hex head. So whatever that wall thickness of the bushing washer is, uh, which is about 38 thou, so it's 0 0.611 plus 38 thou uh, to get this thing made it into place correctly. So we can save this, we can close it, we can go to our um, tuner assembly here, and then we can go to our uh, hex and bring this in. And this is gonna be concentric. And then the distance here is gonna be, distance is gonna be 0 0.611 plus 0, 0.0, 3.8, plus I'll add like uh, 10 thou or 15 thou. I'll add 10 thou. All right, there we go. And this is going to, uh, is not going to spin. So this component here can be parallel to the housing uh, or aligned to the housing. So we could say that's gonna be front plane of this and front plane of the housing are gonna be parallel to one another. Just so that it locks its rotation. Looks like a left-hand thread. 
on the mouse. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, I bet it does. Uh, mouse cam is backwards so that this is my left button, this is my right button for you guys. Uh, Alright, let's get that washer in there. Nice simple part. We like these simple parts, right? 0 0.08, 0 0.0485, S key circle, 0 0.489. Let's do it. And then this one is going to be 0 0.706. And that's going to get extruded to 0 0.038. And material, plain carbon steel, and save. And this will be RBG-608. Is that, what, is that what that one is? Nope, 612. What's 608? Oh, the pinion gear screw, okay. So 612, pushing washer. Tuner bushing washer. All righty, save that. We can do a mate reference here, S key, reference geometry, mate reference, hit the green check mark, uh, check this guy into our project. That's gonna also save it. Go check an active document. Check in, yep. Uh, save, close, go to our assembly here and we're gonna try and pick up this edge which is at the intersection of a cylinder and a plane. So we go R key, drag that guy in, drag drop, boom, done. Dropped it right in there. That's exactly what we wanted. We can go front plane of, or sorry, right plane of this one, right plane of this one, parallel, just to have those aligned and kind of locked down and not have any minuses. It doesn't really matter as much if you have minuses in your assembly. In fact, sometimes you want to have minuses because you want to have motion of your components, but sometimes you want to take the time to get rid of it. And then the final uh, feature that we're going to drop in here is going to be uh, a screw that goes on to really like this like a pan head it goes right in there can I do this as a cross hmm. Hoping I can get in there and have that uh, that option for a crosshead screw. That's really what it is. They all seem to be flathead. And that's not what we want. Am I missing something here? Am I like totally just missing something as far as uh, drive type is there like a drive type option that I'm just like totally overlooking thread length thread display I know that I've seen before where they have drive type all right I'm gonna leave it as that for now we'll uh we'll come back to this a little bit later make sure that we get the correct geometry in there but for now it's fine okay and that is a tuner that is looking pretty darn good let's just look at it in a section view for kind of a sanity check make sure that we uh, are seeing what we expect yep this is what we expected look at this it goes right down sits right in there uh, on that gear yeah it's good this screw is threaded in holding it in place this is threaded into this casing here holding it into place yes that is excellent cool so we'll save that Rebuild, save that whole thing. We will do check in active document to check in that whole tuner to our project, make sure everything is going into the project into the correct spot. And then we will attempt to put that assembly into our uh, top level assembly. Um, once again, we can use the mate reference option. So we could pick this face here. We could go reference geometry, mate reference, and then just use the default option. That edge is at the intersection of a cylinder and a plane. So that should work out. Uh, let's save that assembly, close it. Let's get our, our base here into the correct view. R key, we'll grab that assembly, drag, drop, and look at that thing just snap right into place. How cool is that? How much do we like that? I'll tell you the answer to that question. We like that a lot. 
We can just drag and drop that right into place there. And uh, the only thing left for us to do is just kind of align those heads um, so that they are, you know, rotationally, they are in the correct spot, which I think that, you know, just making them horizontal is probably the best bet for that. Uh, just have them stick right at the side. There's going to be some bases that are a little bit more uh, like stylish as far as the angle of those. Actually, this does look like it has kind of that that kind of angle thing going. Uh, so maybe I will. Maybe I will angle these guys just a little bit. Let's make let's put some style into this thing, right? So we'll say, um, how are we going to do this? Because it's going to become a compound angle, right? Let's see here. Really, we need like the axis that we use for mating. We could probably use that again, uh, which is here in the tuner button. Perpendicular to arc. Yep, that's good. I like that too. To this arc here. I just like it when it's uh, a little bit more to uh, consistent geometry. I think for now, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it. Uh, I'm gonna leave them parallel just for now. Don't worry. I'll 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 revisit this topic. But I'll just make them parallel for now, and we'll we'll come back and talk about this. Maybe I'll I'll tackle this offline a little bit, decide how I'm going to do this. So let's make these parallel, parallel, just plain Jane, just kind of stick it out the side there. Okay, that looks good. Yeah, that's good. That's real good. I like the way that looks. So something that I do for uh, for realism, because um, I have modeled a bass guitar before, a different model, um, and I was it was many many years ago. I've learned a lot since then. Uh, but something that I'll do for realism uh, is I will take this now and create a configuration. So we'll save this as is, and then we'll create a configuration here uh, called uh, what? What's going on here? Okay, there we go. so we'll create a configuration here called uh, string one, or maybe call it like e, e string string dash e, and then we'll create a configuration called string dash whatever, and we'll take this location, we'll add a mate here for string e that defines the location of this tuner head. So we can just kind of like move the tuner head around to whatever, um, and then go to our assembly and take that tuner head, that tuner button, and take its top plane. And then relative to the top plane of the assembly, we can create an angle mate of say 19 degrees. And so we hit the green check mark. And then we can go to our um, configuration tree here and we can say control C, control V. So make a copy of string E and we'll call this one string dash A, for example. And in the A string configuration, we will change that. Whoops, we got display state issue going here. Yeah, this is something that can be pretty annoying about the configuration manager in SolidWorks is the way that it decides to uh, to use uh, display states and kind of hijack display states. So. All right, so instead of doing Control-C, Control-V, I did a right mouse button to add configuration. There you go. Uh, so now for string A, what we could do is we could take that same mate for angle. So this will be called uh, tuning button angle. And we can right mouse button and we can say, um, or we can double click and we can say right mouse button configure dimension. And so we can say for string A, that's gonna be, you know, 19. And for string E, it's gonna be 19. Well, let's, for string A, let's make it uh, 62. Kind of random, I know. And so what that does is it sets us up so that when we go into the assembly, we can have some variation on where these things are tuning to. And it just looks more realistic. It looks more like an actual bass guitar. So this could be the A string configuration and this can be the E string configuration. And since we have our, um, our gear mate driving the location of the tuning peg, you know, we could even have that with some deviation. Like if we if we get in here, maybe instead of making A at 62, let's say we, we change this so that um, it's at 310. 
I was expecting that to move the tuning peg too. It really didn't. It's kind of interesting. I was hoping that would move both of them for that uh, sake of of realism, right? That I that I mentioned a moment ago. Gear mate's still in there. Wonder what's going on there. Let's see. Gear mate is. No longer engaging. Interesting. Interesting. I don't know if I like that too much. I might have to do like a move for this configuration only. Motor lives in motion. So that is true. The motor lives there, but the gear meat lives here in the main assembly. Uh, you are correct, uh, Robert. The motor is in the motion study, but... anymore I deleted it because it didn't work right <laughs> all right so let's go to uh e string configuration it moves slightly i wonder if we have to do this a different way we might have to do like uh see i don't like leaving the stuff loose i like being able to just get in there and dial in a number um there is an option here in the configuration properties for uh, move for this configuration only. So it's, um, it's not there. Maybe it's in the move command itself. When you go to move, you can do move for this configuration only, there it is. So I click the move command and then I've got this option to move just for this configuration, so. Interesting. I'm going to try this one more time with the wrestle in this gear mate. So let's say we move. And then we unsuppress the gear mate. Now let's see what happens here in our. Hmm. I don't like that too much. Now nothing's moving. Yeah, I don't like that too much. All right, I guess a different approach might be to take the mate for parallel or for, or for, for angle or whatever, tuning button angle. And we could say that that is going to be um, something nominal uh, like zero. So it's nice and flat. See, it's just a, it's a shame that that's not driving, it doesn't seem to be driving the gear mate. Like the gear mate just doesn't even, just seems to be ignoring that. That really uh, doesn't. Yeah, see, look, the gear mate just totally ignores that. That's, sorry to say it, but that is weak. That's some weak action right there. All right, well, let's get our gear mate looking good. You guys know that I love SolidWorks. I hate to talk trash on it, but that's pretty weak. Considering, you know, oh, whatever. Okay. So now let's go to, let's take those mates and put them at the top of the tree so that they're easy to find. Since all of our mates solve simultaneously. And then let's go to our configuration for E string. And for the E string configuration, let's just suppress those mates. So we'll do, uh, sorry, we'll suppress this mate, the tuning button mate, and then we'll say move and we'll say advanced for this configuration only. And we will move this guy around a few. So it looks cool. And green check mark. And then let's go to our A string configuration. 
And in the A string configuration, let's suppress the angle mate. Okay, it's already suppressed. And then let's do a move component and we'll say for this configuration only, and we'll move this. I forget what it even looked like in the E string configuration. <laughs> move this like this and let's see what they look like. All right, there we go. That's good. I like that. Now they're at totally different angles and it's going to look much more realistic in the assembly. There we go. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. And let's make sure that our housing is shown. There we go. Yeah, see, I like that a lot more. I do wish it was locked down. I mean, I'm tempted to like do a lock rotation or something to get it to lock down, but I do not like the way this looks at all. I'll tell you that right now. That chamfer looks like garbage. Huh, that's better. <laughs> Sometimes it's the little things that make the big differences. Okay, so uh, let's finish up our lesson today just talking about mirror components and what works and what doesn't with mirror components. So we could certainly take this assembly here and mirror it about this, and that's where I'm going to start. So we'll go here to uh, component pattern mirror components. Now, the way that this mirror components works is that you start picking components that you want to mirror. In this case, I'm getting the full sub assembly. And then within that sub assembly, we can pick whether or not we want the, the components within that sub assembly to have a left hand and a right hand version. See, not every single component needs a left hand, right hand version. In fact, you can make the argument that the only thing that really needs a left hand, right hand version is the housing itself. So I could click the housing itself and then I could say create opposite hand version. And as soon as I do that, you'll notice that the mirrored result looks pretty good. So I made the opposite hand version of that, uh, 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 of the housing itself. It's what I did. So just to, just to show that whole thing again here, I pick the right plane. I choose, sorry, let me just take this back one step. So now what we're going to do with this assembly, now that we've got our tuners in place there, is we are going to try to create a mirrored version of the uh, the, the sub-assembly for the tuner. So the sub-assembly looks like this. This will work if we're looking at the left side of the headstock, but now we need to make a version for the right side of the headstock. And the only component that actually needs a left hand and a right hand version is this component here highlighted in blue. So let's go back to our top level assembly and let's choose to create a mirror of this uh, tuner head here. So we go to our mirror components option and from the tree, we can choose the plane to mirror about, which is going to be the right plane. And then we can choose the sub assembly for that tuner and we can choose the next arrow up top here. Now, once we choose the next arrow, we see that the results look okay but they're a little bit off. It's not quite centered correctly in the hole. And the reason why is because SolidWorks is not creating a left-hand, right-hand version of the housing. It's just taking the housing and flipping it over. So this area here of the housing is getting flipped down to here. Well, that's not what we need. So we're gonna click the plus button in the name of the assembly here. And we're gonna click the name of the component that requires a left-hand and a right-hand version that is the housing itself. And it's highlighted in purple here. And then down at the bottom of this property manager, we're gonna click the button that says create opposite hand version. And so when we say create opposite hand version, now this gets like a little flag on it saying it's gonna have a left hand, right hand version. And the assembly itself gets a little flag on it saying it's gonna have a left hand, right hand version. But the preview looks excellent. That's exactly what we want. And so we are going to uh, choose the next arrow here and then from the next arrow, we're going to say that we want to add either a prefix or a suffix, or we could say that we just want to create a whole new file name for these things. So the file name for the assembly is going to be RBG 6002 tuner assembly. And this one uh, will be called right. And then the housing here is going to get the new name uh, 601B tuner housing 
dash mirrored, something like that. Or this could get a whole new number, right? We've been working with these part numbers. Maybe we go out to now 614 or uh, maybe 621 since this is the mirrored version. So 621 tuner housing mirrored. And so we can go next. It says, what do you want to mirror into this new assembly? So you can choose, you know, anything, anything that you want here in the, uh, in the new version of the assembly, the new version of the parts, and we can hit the green check mark. And it says the following mates could not be replicated. So you get some warnings here about some of the mates, uh, as you're creating this mirror, but when you hit, okay, you can see that you now have a new version of the sub assembly where all the geometry has been mirrored. And if we examine that subassembly, we can see that it will have a new file name. So the new file name here is uh, RBG 6002. So the assembly got a new file name there. And we can also see that the, um... oh, give me one second here guys, sorry. And we can also see that uh, from that new file, after we have that new file name, uh, we can see that if we open up that assembly into its own window, that the first component in here got a new file name as well, 621. And that that component has a feature tree, which is entirely referencing the original model. So this entire feature tree here, it's all derived from that original model. If the original model changes, this mirrored version of the model will also change. So it's a mirrored version of, uh, of this component. So that certainly works. Um, it certainly gives us, you know, our, our new tuner over here on this side. Um, it gives us a sub assembly that we can examine. Now the question is, you know, which of those mates are missing and will the sub assembly work? So you notice that, uh, some of this stuff is not really working correctly, but Hey, looks like the gear mate did work. That's good. So maybe it's just this concentric mate that we lost here. Um, so this has a center axis for mating. We can make that concentric. The gear mate still works. That's not that bad. Not that bad at all. You know, pretty much gave us what we wanted there. Uh, do we have the configurations on this side? We do not have the configurations on this side. So what we would want to do is, um, well, first of all, we would want to examine this and what's going on here? Is this, oh, this is all free floating, huh? So yeah, we're gonna have to do a little bit of mate cleanup on this, uh, on this side of things. It's kind of interesting what did mate and what did not mate. I wonder what the the rationale is there. But that's going to be concentric here. That should start to line things up. Uh, this is going to be... What do we do with this one in the original? That's the question. So we did concentric, coincident to the bottom of that thing, concentric to the... Okay, coincident to that face. Okay, so yeah, we just pushed it right up against that face in the assembly. So uh, this is going to be... Oh, this is interesting. This one got flipped. Uh, the mate, the mate uh, alignment for concentric got flipped on this one. So we need to flip that back. So this here, we need to flip the mate alignment. Yeah, there we go. Now that can come up. And then this guy here has a flipped mate alignment as well for concentric there. Okay. And then this face is just going right up against this face here, coincident. And then this, I think we just made this coincident here as well. All right, so not too bad. There's always a little bit of cleanup, or I shouldn't say always, but there's often some cleanup that needs to take place when you're working uh, with mirrored geometry. But I think for the most part, we're good. Got this thing, whoops, maybe spoke too soon. Uh, 
kind of going through and looking at all these. Okay. So then this is supposed to go right up against this. Okay. All right. I think that's good. I think we can definitely work with that. I think that's uh, that certainly uh, saves us a lot of time going through and recreating all the mates for that. Uh, um, you know, for that version of the assembly. And then from here, we could go to our configurations and we could say add configuration uh, for string D. And then we could do a move component and say this configuration only and kind of move this thing into a new uh, alignment. And then we could do add configuration and this is gonna be called string G. And once again, we could do a move component and kind of move this thing into a, a slightly different alignment again. D, G, save. Um, we could even go back to our assembly here, our top level assembly. Save this. And then from here, what we could do is we could just make a copy of that. You know, we don't have to use the one that comes out of the, the mirror feature if we if we want to kind of divorce the the mirror uh, mirror geometry relationships here. So we could delete that mirror geometry out of uh, that you know that location, and then we could do a click and drag on this edge, which shares the cylindric and, and um, uh, planar face, and then we can hold or just press Alt. You can just tap Alt. And then when you take your mouse over another edge that shares that same definition and you let go, you're going to get that peg and hole uh, mating relationship. Now, in this case, when I did it, I ended up with uh, the mate alignment incorrect. So if I try that again, so click this edge here, begin dragging, press um, Alt, move my mouse over this edge down at the bottom of this hole. Oops. Try this again this edge here alt and go over this edge man i had it the first time first time it went in there good uh the mate alignment was wrong but it got in there good doesn't seem to want to do it this time let's try it here this edge alt this edge here eh, it doesn't want to do it that's interesting Well, we could just do it the traditional way. I was hoping to show you guys a, a quick meet there. Starting to get some uh, laggy performance. I think I've maybe gone a little too overboard with my tiny little fillets and whatnot. So I may need to do some simplification, some cleanup of this thing. Or maybe even just, uh, it may just be an image quality thing, actually. I might have dialed up the image quality to do some uh, social media related posts. But here we can see that we can mate this into place as well. Uh, giving us that kind of final component for that tuner assembly. We can make sure that the, uh, the the cover is shown in all of our configurations. And we can go back to our assembly now and say that we want uh, this front uh, right plane to be parallel to the right plane. And we can say that we want this right plane to be parallel to the right plane. And after we do that, then we can right mouse button and change this configuration to the configuration for the D string. And we can right mouse button and change this configuration to the configuration for the G string. And that gives us, like I said, kind of a, a more realistic you know, layout of these things. The four tuners are all kind of uh, in different positions. The four uh, uh, tuning posts are in different positions, except for this one I know is not. <laughs> so, you know, it's just kind of a funny coincidence. Let's open that up and take a look at the, the D string. This is another spot where it's good to use this trick. If you pick the name of the assembly from the tree, you can use this option for open in position. And then it opens it up right into that position. So now I could go to move component and I can say that this is going to be for this configuration only. And then I could adjust this so that it's, you know, something different from what, what I was seeing in the assembly a moment ago. So now if I save that and return to the assembly. There we go. Now that one's vertical. 
Now these two look like they're almost aligned. Well, look, this is just how it is in the real world, okay? Sometimes they do end up being aligned and it just looks cool, right? It's no big deal. But uh, that's the uh, that's a good place to stop, I think. I think that, that got us to where we wanted to be today. We got the four machine heads on there. They look good. They look real. Um, I'll do a little bit of cleanup tonight going through and maybe uh, divorcing some of these components from Toolbox. And I might get rid of some of the tiny little details that I have on these things uh, that nobody can see anyway, just to help things move a little bit faster. But what do you guys think about today's stream? Did you enjoy it? Let me know in the comments. Let me know in the chat. Of course, be sure to like, to subscribe, maybe consider picking up a Too Tall Toby t-shirt. They are, of course, the softest t-shirts in the CAD game. And uh, thank you guys, as always, for joining me. I really look forward to these streams. This has uh, been a lot of fun. Uh, I know that we are winding down on the end, and I'm very excited to get to the end. Uh, but uh, I've been having a lot of fun along the way. I've been looking forward to doing these streams every day. So thank you guys so much for being a part of this. I think the base is looking fantastic. I'm very happy with how this thing is looking and uh, been very happy to be doing these streams with you guys. Let me know, of course, if you have any suggestions, any ideas on what we could do to make the streams better. I know that we're winding down on the end of this particular challenge this particular data set but uh i got plenty more in the queue ready to go so uh this uh you know tuesday wednesday thursday streaming sessions i think are working out good i think it's a great way to convey a lot of good information to uh, anybody who's out there in the world of 3d cad working with solidworks right now who knows what the future holds maybe i'll do a project in a different cad system maybe it's time to start uh branching out and demonstrating some of the other cad systems that are out there so we'll see what the future brings but for now i think this was good uh, I guess the other thing I got to start doing is soldering this thing back together, uh, the, the actual physical base and remounting the neck and remounting the tuners and everything uh, so we can get this thing back into a playable condition and, you know, give it away. We're going to give away the physical base. So this base here that I play on the intro video could be yours, you know, if you want to get in here and uh, keep paying attention. I don't know how I'm going to do the giveaway, but I'll figure it out uh, over the next couple of weeks. So thank you guys so much. This has been awesome. Looking forward to tomorrow. Tomorrow we will do the cover for the truss rod and we will start working on the strings. And I think we'll be done with the strings by Thursday and that, that'll that pretty much be a wrap. All right, guys, have a great rest of your Tuesday. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you guys on Wednesday tomorrow. Bye, everybody.